wrapped them. It was beautiful. Um, I don't. I wouldn't call it really beautiful. It was a black wrap with uh, niggers doing this, nigger doing that, nigger, 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 you know. But it was his poetry. And when he was rapping, he was in his body. He was centered in his body. And he was talking with his body. He was centered. When he wasn't rapping, he was standing like this. He was disconnected from his body because he hated it. Anyway, so we got into that. So then finally they, they broke the church and I took the pictures, made some money and went home. And then the two ladies that organized it came over to my house this morning at 9 o'clock to uh, pick up the pictures. And I was telling them about talking to the young man and about almost missing the appointment. And uh, then they got to talk. Then, then I said, well, I do. I'm going to teach uh, at uh, LLI. And uh, I teach the meditation. Oh, you teach that? Well, we really could use some of that. So uh, she's the head of the church, so they, they organized a workshop. And they're going to invite all the, the leaders of all the other black churches to come. And I'm going to have a room full. And I'll do this class to see if they want to have a course. All right, so that's Dharma. So despite myself, you see. <laughs> There's a conspiracy. Dharma is a conspiracy. So my friend didn't go, which freed me from, if I go into yoga bell, forget it, you see. My wife remembered, right? I got to the church. The church was late getting out. I had this marvelous talk with this young man who made me realize that this is what I do. And then the ladies came over and booked me for a workshop. I had no, this was not voluntary, <laughs> you see. This was not conscious, this was not me doing it. Me tried to get out of it, me tried to forget it. <laughs> see? But the Dharma is, is, is not communicating verbally, it's communicating through the, our world. So the Dharma is communicating to you through your world but the me has no idea what it's, that it's going on, you see. So this practice is basically learning how to relax our sense of me so the Dharma can begin to move. And when it moves, you feel it, you see. The reason me's, the reason our me's is so full of old age, sickness, and death is because we don't feel our ground anymore. There's a sense of being lost or floating or lost of center, you see. But the ground is there, but we have to let go of the me in order to walk with it. Like my mother walked to get the poop, to get the keys. I don't know what I'm doing, but I, or the Aborigines, right? I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm okay. <laughs> so, okay, you all. I'm sorry we didn't get to practice the Yoga Nidra today, but go ahead and play with this this week. It won't hurt. Uh, you can just do the first part, you can try the whole thing. Um, what I've been suggesting to people is that is that you create a time when you're going to sit in your practice, uh, morning or evening or whatever is good for you. Set a time for 20 minutes, 15 minutes. You can start with by playing a section of this. It's broken up into five little sections. You'll see it when uh, it's very self-explanatory. And uh, you can put this on a CD player. And if you have a remote, you can pause it or just push a button and then just sit for the rest of the time, coasting in the stillness that the tape creates, right? So this kind of like gets you through the, your surface ship, the world, kind of like gets you through the, you flood, you know, flood the, you know, flood the tanks and you go down. This kind of like gets you going and then you kind of like rest in it uh, for the remainder of time. You get a little time, I would say 20 minutes. Uh, they'll let you know. 
And I think the first one here is 12 minutes, and the other sections are maybe eight or something like that. Each one of these Yoga Nidra apps will connect you in a different way with our ground. You know, one, you know the, uh, the first one deals with sensing the body, and the second one is the breath. The third is thinking, the fourth is feeling, and the fifth one is getting a sense of our personality. So it's really takes you just like the submarine going down different levels of stillness. And it really works. People have been reporting that um, it, it, um, either in this class and other people that I've given it to uh, report that it is very effective in um, not only helping them sleep better, but helping them uh, uh, discover a center that, that is not, reconstruct their center so that it, that's not threatened by the, the, the vortex of dread. Okay. Yeah. Do you call that synchronicity, too? What happened yesterday, Jung calls synchronicity. What happened yesterday? Sunday. Yeah. The synchronicity. Is, uh, but but the, uh, what the problem is that in our me world, it's always considered to be lucky or a fluke or maybe God smiled on me or my angel was looking over me or I got a lucky fairy or, you know, whatever. Something external causes it, to, in our view, something external, either magical or luck, chance, caused it externally to happen for a little while or a moment, but then we go right back into where did it go, you see. So this practice, basically, is to live in that all the time, because that is the natural state of life. The me is the unnatural state of life. It's about our life, whereas in the first half, we didn't give a hoot about that. <laughs> because we were too busy getting our meat going, getting our meat straight. So, um, uh, three, okay, what I wanted to do today. All right, let, let me pick up here. Uh, the practice part is yoga nidra. So, we, this is an audio CD. We're gonna do, we do this in class. Huh? Both of them audio? No, that's DVD. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Yoga Nidra. You guys have one. Uh, our Yoga Nidra means, well, yoga means union. And Nidra means uh, um, Sanskrit word for sleep. But basically, it's the sleep of me, the thinking machine. So what we're interested in in this practice is letting the thinking machine quiet down, right? To let go of the need to think about everything. Because the thinking machine is afraid of not thinking because who is me? The me is a thinking machine. You stop thinking. Me is threatened by the vortex. I'll go into a vortex if I don't think, so I gotta keep thinking. That's why when we get worried, upset, we think more. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to keep away the vortex. And what hap one of the things that happens in meditation is that when you do sit down, thinking will increase, and you say, oh, this is a bunch of crap. <laughs> it's not working at all. Well. Basically, that's what it's supposed to happen. It's, it's kind of like if you have a truck or a car with a stick shift, and you've got your foot on the gas, and you're going along, and you put the clutch in, and you keep the foot on the gas, the engine goes faster. Right? The car starts slowing down because you took it out of gear, but the engine is racing. So that's what meditation is. When you sit to meditate, uh, you're putting your foot on the clutch but you haven't learned to take the foot off the gas yet. So the thinking goes faster. And then you say, oh, this is a bunch, you know, this is stupid. It's not working. 
I feel worse now than I did before. So that's a transition. Uh, you know, that, that's part of the transition going from the surface <coughs> to, the, to the quiet. So to get from the noise to the quiet, you have to go through a transition period. And most people don't go there because they don't have a map that understands the laws, what's going on. It's like with, with medicine, you know, if you got something wrong with you, you go to the doctor and you say, oh my God, and I'm threatened by a vortex, it could be anything, oh my God, you know, and he tells you what it is, you feel a lot relieved. Oh, well, now I know what it is. You know, so that helps restore the center. So this practice then threatens the me, and we need understanding in order to keep from getting flipped over. So oh, it's okay, this is going on. Um, okay, so the Yoga Nidra practice has uh, five there are five such, it's a guided meditation by a man named Richard Miller. And he is, uh, this is on here. It is? No, I'm asking you. Oh, Richard yeah, this, yeah, this is the Yoga Nidra one here. Okay. Yeah, Richard Miller teaches this. This is him speaking. Uh, he's written, there's a book called Yoga Nidra with the CD in it that, that I just gave you. He teaches this all over the country as what he calls um, IRIST. He's copyrighted it. And he teaches it to, uh, teaches people how to teach it, and he teaches it to particularly, very successfully, to uh, uh, vets suffering from post-traumatic syndrome. But it works in all populations, but it's been very sexful with people who are trying to get free of a traumatized me. So uh, that's his voice, and there are five stages or five exercises the whole thing takes 30 minutes. <clears throat> the way I use this is, is that uh, I found that, uh, that meditation is not for Western people just coming into meditation. It's not easy to do it on your own. It's, it's helpful to have a guide that will kind of like walk you through until you get stabled a little bit so that you're able to... Uh, Build your resolve. That this, this. Yeah, it, it's almost uh, mandatory. Yeah. You know, because you you won't get there on your own. No, it, it's uh, you. Yeah, it's like going into a dark room. You don't know where to go. So this this whole talk by Rodney Smith is on I resolve. It's it's on the value of resolve or intention, setting your resolve to do this. Uh, because if you don't have that resolve. Uh, you'll try it for a few days, and then all the hell with this, and then you quit. And then maybe a month later, well, you know, really, you're fine. maybe you go back, and then uh, it didn't last. And then maybe six years later, you come back, you know, I really thought, try that again. And then, oh, well, you know, and then 10 years later, or maybe 50 years later, <laughs> you're back to Alan Watts. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> I'm in a different stage now than right. I was. My center has been gone, and I'm so glad for this class because I, am I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. But my husband died a few years ago, and yeah. it's just like since then I've just been spiraling downwards. Right. Well, yeah, that's not, a, not understanding. That's a loss of center. Because of marriage, for me, it was. Well, all marriages hold us in place, even mm -hmm. if it's painful. Yeah. Even if abusive marriages, yeah. people can't leave an abusive marriage because it holds them in place and keeps away the vortex. <coughs> you see? So, uh, um, yeah, so this, 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 this me is, is, is not like a marble. It's, it's really a relationship that, that creates uh, a sense of me as being permanent. So the relationship that creates the sense of me as being permanent. Now, two things can happen. Either the other person changes, and changes the rules. Uh, either they actually do change, or they have hidden parts that you didn't know about. <laughs> and it comes forward. Where did that come from? 
you know, that wasn't the person I married, you see. You know, but it was there, we just didn't see it. Or they actually do grow some different limbs. Uh, and they want to change, or they need a bigger pot or something. Uh, and so if, if we're s s centered in that, well then we begin to fear the vortex, you see, mm -hmm. by the other person changing the rules. So we either, we either change with them or get divorced. Can I add something? Yeah. Uh, you remind me of a, a lady years ago wrote a book right. because she, moved, she went to Australia and she did a walkabout with the Aborigines. Yeah. And so she comes into this and she asks them, where are you walking? You know what the answer was? We don't know. Yeah. So she starts walking with them and she said they subsist on practically nothing, right. and they walk, and they walk, and they walk, and they walk, and it, it just grounds her to nothing. Right. And they're still walking. Yeah. But they're always at home. But they're, right. So my mother, when she was 100 years old, lost her poodle keys, no, her car keys, and she knew they were in the house because the car was outside, and she was looking everywhere. Maybe they're under there. Um, did I miss it? Maybe they're under there. <laughs> you know what we do when we lose the keys, you know. And so she searched over and over and she finally went over there. She said, I'm having, I'm having heart trouble. <laughs> Had a pacemaker. You know, my, you know I'm going to die worrying about the keys because, you know, where are they? So then, then she said, well, I just gave it to God. I says, I quit. I and just dropped the whole thing. And immediately she just walked, not knowing where she was going, to the bedroom put her hand in a sweater and came under the keys. Amazing. So then at that moment, she surrendered the me and the fear of the vortex and was grounded in her body, and her body knew where the keys were. <coughs> so that kind of like brings us back. I, I wanted to play the first part of this yoga nidra. Um, so that kind of like brings us back to the Buddha when Mara, which is is a, is a metaphor for me, the mind, and with the mind, the known world and what you should do and all of that, why you want to leave it, why you think you can leave it, and the Buddha pointed to the ground, right? So that is equivalent to my mother giving up the fear of where are my keys and just surrendering to her, which was not conscious. In other words, the idea of of just walking into the bedroom and putting your hand in the sweater was as if being guided by a superior intelligence that could not communicate with her or us because it doesn't have a language. Me has a language, right? Thinks, talks, ours is English. So we can talk to other me's, but you can't talk to another body. Hmm. People have pets. Do y'all have pets? So the pet operates here. And anybody has a pet just begins to communicate or get in sync with that. You know, you know what the dog's book. We have a little poodle, so we know what the dog's behavior is when it wants to go out or eat or whatever. You know, so we're in we're communicating, but there's no verbal transmission going on, you see. So that's why people have pets, because it grounds the me to something solid. And it helps keep away the vortex that is inherent in the me. The ungrounded me is always standing on the edge of the vortex. Mm -hmm. Any minute, uh, something could, you could go out the door, slip on the, slip on some water, hit your head, and that would be it. But, you know, it's that the, the, the vortex is always next to the me, and uh, but it's it trembles like earth. You know, the slightest challenge is like an earthquake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the vortex coming. You know, so you you grab onto anything. Um, uh, okay. All right, let's listen to the, uh, this it takes about 12 minutes for the first one, it's introductory. And um, I hope that thing is still connected. So let's, let's uh, so just when you, when you do your practice, you can either 
You can either lie on the floor, you can lie on the bed when you do this, or you can just sit in a chair mm -hmm. like this. But, but when you sit in a chair to do the practice, uh, get your, sit in a chair so that your legs can be right yeah. angles and you're not you know, sitting up like this or having your feet swing. So it's a comfortable chair, hands in your lap, relax the breath. So uh, this is a uh, let's let's get get do this so then we can talk a little bit about it. I hope I'm still connected. Is that the one for pain? That first one in there? It's body sensing. Oh. Sensing the body. Pain. Uh, yeah. Because one of them's for breathing. And yeah. So. Um, <coughs> I think I've lost my connection. Does that mean you're in the vortex? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Bluetooth speaker. I know. I can tell. Um, no wires. But when I, when it goes to sleep, then it loses my connection, and uh, I don't know what it is. Well, I know what happened. I turned it off. Hmm. Well, it's really lost it. Now, I'll, uh, uh, I'll tell you what. You just, uh, we're just, uh, we're just about to finish here. So I'll uh, take this home. And uh, the first, uh, and work with this. Um, and listen to this. This talk on the, uh, uh, by Rodney Smith, uh, this DVD, is about, a, it's about an hour talk. It plays on your TV. Uh, this talk was was given is this on the DVD. This, this talk is given in a uh, the uh, Seattle Insight Meditation Society, and it's given to people who are in this practice. So it's not like for beginners. But he's but this specific talk I like because he's really talking about the uh, uh, the importance of intention, uh, a resolve uh, as the as the engine that makes the Dharma work. So let me let me speak a little bit about Dharma. Uh, this is a strange word. Uh, it means uh, it's a Sanskrit word, and it means uh, duty. One, there's different levels of meaning. It's teaching, or duty. One's duty or the teaching. On a spiritual level, Dharma means is. Uh, both objective teaching, like you could read about, or read a book on meditation. So you read a book on meditation or listen to Eckhart Tolle. You're listening to what's called a Dharma talk. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's subjective. That's, that's me listening to or reading a Dharma talk. But then there is the subjective Dharma, which I'm doing Dharma. Let me give you an example of that. So Dharma, the doing of the Dharma is a discovery of the Dharma, where the reading of the Dharma would be more like a learning of it. But the discovery of the Dharma is when you discover you've got this, suddenly you have this great parking spot. <laughs> so here's an example of the discovery of the Dharma. So, uh, last Saturday, 
friend of mine was over, and he said, you know, I, I feel like going up to Yogaville on Sunday. You want to go up there? And I said, sure. Uh, so he said, well, I'll give you, if I can go, I'll give you a call. So he didn't call. So the next morning, Sunday, I didn't, uh, I thought, well, he's not going. Okay. So uh, we, on Sunday, we have a late breakfast, a brunch. So we're sitting there at 12 o'clock uh, having brunch, and my wife says, uh, didn't you have a photography shoot? 12.30, I was to take group pictures at a church, a black church in town. It was 12 o'clock. <laughs> so, uh, oh my God, so I grabbed the camera, went over there, and they told me to be there at 12.30. So, um, I get there at 12.30, and it's still, they're still going inside, and so uh, there was a young fella out there pacing around, and uh, one of the ladies comes out that had booked me, and she said, uh, Oh, we're not going to get out to about 2 o'clock. You know how black churches are. So, <laughs> so I'm out there in the parking lot. So I strike up a conversation with this young man. And he meets me and he says, uh, my name is Nick. I said, hi, you know, you're waiting. Yeah, I'm waiting. You know. He said, they're just getting started. And so uh, he said, my name is Nick. And then he says, I don't really like my name. Well, that's not my real name. I don't really like my name. And it was Darfo or I don't know what it was. I forgot it. So we got struck up a conversation. And um, he was a very, uh, he's a young man, he has a seven month old child who was in the church, and that's what he's waiting for. And uh, he, his wife's working and he's staying home taking care of the kid. But he's, he's, he is uh, caught in the vortex of meaninglessness. You know, I don't, you know, I'm, and he's, cre I said, what do you do this creative? He says, I write rap. So he, uh, he's a poet, but he doesn't, realize he's a poet. <laughs> you know, he thinks he's, he's lost. He does, he's not a man. He hasn't got a job. His wife puts him down, says, you know, wants him to be more Christian, and he doesn't want to fit in that thing, you know, so and the rap's evil, and, but I do it, you know. And he's, he smokes pot to control his anger, you know, and that kind of... It's so with anyway. Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle is in the oral tradition. Uh, in other words, a lot of his, his teaching is just talks. He just sit and sits in a chair, and he looks like a little uh, bookkeeper. You know, he's kind of a mild-mannered, mm -hmm. a little, he's bent over because he's like he's been over his books, you know, like a book, you know, an accountant. So he's an accountant. Well, he was an accountant. You know, but that kind of like uh, very, un very, very uh, unimposing type of personality. But he just sits in a chair and talks. You can hear him thinking. Yeah, but he's speaking. You know what I'm saying? But he's speaking. I mean, he's not. He's not looking at a teleprompter. No. In other words, it's just speech. Yeah. Uh, another word. Another way you might want to connect. I, also, too, what I do is I connect a lot of this Buddha Dharma stuff up with Christianity and with our material world today. So a lot. All of these are interrelated. Uh, the related word that you would find in Christianity would be uh, the word. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a prayer in Catholicism which I really love is speak but the word and my soul will be healed. I know that one. <laughs> speak but the word. Now the the flip here is that from the from the position of being without the, from the position of being a wounded soul, I'm appealing to Jesus, God, Buddha, somebody to heal me, right? That's what that would, that one way of looking at that, that, that prayer. Speak but the word and my soul will be healed. So I'm saying, somebody with the word, power to heal, speak the word and I'll be healed, is the way a lot of people in turn. So I'll play, you know, you know so I'm praying to Mary or somebody to heal me. This practice is not uh, is, is what's called non-dual. So non-dual means one, dual means two. So Right. So this is kind of like a yin yang, but let me 
Act society is a dual, thinks of the world in a dual way. Me, you, that's, that's two. Me versus the world, that's two. Me versus God, and then I ask God to heal my soul, that's two, right? So this is the way we see things. That's the way we, this is the way our thinking machine works. This is the thinker, and then there's the stuff I'm thinking about. Two. Right? <laughs> Two. <laughs> All right, so the Buddha teaching is non-dual, so it, it's always going towards one instead of two. So when you say, speak but the word and my soul will be healed, when you look at it from the Dharma, I have to speak the word to heal myself. So when I find my word that unites my When I find the word that unites my thinking machine, which is my mind, with my ground or body, when I find the word that unites these two opposites, I am healed. So I speak the word that, that heals my soul, the soul that being the idea of one. That has no second, you see. So it flips us from being the created and wanting to ask the deity to fix me, or the mechanic, or the therapist, or whatever, to being my own guru, or being my own savior. Um, so then the practice of the Dharma is the practice of discovering how to speak one's word. And when you can speak your word, the suffering of old age, sickness, and death drops off. Because the suffering of old age, sickness, and death is the suffering of a thinking machine that has no body. That's, that's lost its ground, you see. In our society, is a society of thinking machines that, we, that has lost its ground. So we're all running around looking for our center that will help ground us, you see. So we look for it in political people and religion and whatever. Um, so, um, so we've got several things going on here. Um, Getting back to the movie and the thinking machine that did not solve the puzzle until it found a center, and the center was something that was consistent around which all it could, it could, it was like, it was like a compass, you know, you got a compass and, and one leg of the compass sinks into the map and then the other one goes around like that, mm -hmm. in and out, whatever, but it has to have one of them has to be anchored or it just falls over. So that, that centering ankle, anger, ankle uh, has to be somewhere. What happens in our society, uh, oh, and if you, don't, if you don't have a center and the compass falls over, um, it's the feeling of dread in a vortex. I was watching on uh, Facebook today, somebody was, uh, are you all on Facebook? Can you get on that? No? Yes? Okay. Well, if you, you can look me up, I write on Facebook all the time. It's kind of like my uh, outlet, because I'm a writer. And, uh, and uh, there, somebody posted a little YouTube thing about a whirlpool, and it was just a river. And it had a big whirlpool about this big in it, and it was, everything was, that was floating in the river was going into this whirlpool, and he didn't know where it was coming out. And we just sit there and watch it, you know, on this YouTube. And I guess the thing ran for 20 minutes. <laughs> just watching this whirlpool. And people were writing on there, well, where does everything go? <laughs> and it was just, it was just really fascinating. And I connected it up to uh, this, is that the, the whirlpool is a vortex. You see it in the bathroom. 
the tub. And, you know, it's not a little tornado, it's a vortex. And the mind, when we lose our center, somebody dies, you lose your job. I mean, you, a center is kind of like uh, placements. Okay, so, uh, no, so here's your, here's your table, right? And it's got placemats on it. And everybody knows everybody's got your name. This is Downton Abbey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So you got your names here. And you go there, I sit here, and you sit there. And you know where everybody sits, and you know what the matters are, right? And everything is at peace, you know. But if there's a disturbance, you don't show up, or somebody, where's my placemat? Or somebody dies or something, and it all gets, that's a vortex, you know, like we got to get it back. We got to get, get things back in order, right? Uh, so we, that's the loss of the center. You know, when, when, the, when, the, when the matriarch dies, the whole family goes nuts. They've lost it, or the, or the patriarch. Not the, you know, or the, the children go crazy when the mother or father die because that's a center for them. Or divorce is a break in the center for the child. Yeah. Um, you know, so in marriage, we make the other person our center. So all these centers, religious, and Christ is the center of Christianity. You know, uh, the Hajj is the center of Islam, that big obelisk that everybody runs around. Um, so, so all have these social and individual centers that keep us away from the whirlpool. Because the whirlpool is worse than death, you see. It, it's, uh, the whirlpool is like uh, non-existence. I mean, it's, uh, uh, we, if we get caught in the vortex, we're headed for a panic attack, psychosis, and even suicide. Uh, so this, the, so everything we try, and this is a, this is a, a function of human consciousness, is that human consciousness, different from animals and the rest, is is that we are aware that we're aware. See, I'm aware that I'm aware of you and myself. I'm aware of my thoughts, and I'm aware of you and things going on, and I'm aware that I'm aware, right? Now, what if I get, uh, what if my center is being a good Christian and I'm not supposed to be angry, and I get angry at somebody? So now I'm aware that I'm angry, right? And now I'm angry at myself for being angry. And now I'm, over, I'm angry at myself for being angry at being angry. And now I'm angry at myself for being angry for being angry for being angry for being angry, and that's a vortex. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> now I've got to have you know, some uh, Valium or something, <laughs> drink a martini, or, or go find a priest or a therapist. But I, you know, I, I'm, it's very easy to slip into a vortex, and we, we all know that feeling. It's panic or dread, and we, need, and we go find a friend to talk to, you know, we, find, we have to find something that can center us. Calm down, right? It's okay. It's all right. Calm down. And so we kind of like regain our, we, we, we get stabilized by somebody else who's firm in their center, and we kind of like regain our placemats and put ourselves back together a little bit. Um, so, I mean, these are very, this is a very common thing. So the, the, The center um, let's see, I want to get into this. Okay. So I hope you have the idea of the need for a center. And we have to have a center, a sense of that whole it, the center is kind of like uh, well the hole in the donut, right? I mean, without the hole in the donut, you don't have a donut. They may have a biscuit, but you don't have a donut. So, or the hub of a wheel, right? I mean, the center integrates all of the data and information that comes in. Like in the Enigma code, when they found that one little constant, the Heil Hitler, that was a center around which the machine, that would, like one 
instead of the machine just being floating out of infinite possibilities, it had an anchor. Now it could op now it could find the it could figure out the variables because it had an anchor. So uh, this 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 center that we have created in the in the Western society to avoid the vortex of old age sickness and death, which is what the Buddha was experiencing, is me. Um, so it's kind of like, particularly in America, we have created and idealized a separate sense of me as an individual. And this me the me has the feeling of being outside of the world observing it. I can observe the world. I observe you and I observe uh, Richmond, and I observe my memory. I observe everything from a viewpoint of me. I mean, we, we can sense this. I mean, I mean, it's right here. It's kind of like if you go up in the Blue Ridge and you drive along the Blue Ridge, you've got overlooks. So I stop at this overlook, and I look overlook the valley. And so everything I see is integrated according to that viewpoint. I don't see the other side of the mountains. Then I drive down here, right? And I look and now everything is integrated to that viewpoint. And I might see what the other viewpoint didn't see. And if I go up this way, I see it's the same valley, but I'm seeing different viewpoints. But I know from my memory that it's all the same. You know, it's not like it's what we talk about Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer would say, well, oh, this is a great valley. I've never seen it before. Oh, this is a great valley. I've never seen it before, right? Oh, this is beautiful. I've never seen it before. <laughs> they're having the same experience, right? But their memory is dis disconnected, so they don't remember. There's no me there. The me remembers that I saw this here and here and here, and it integrates it all together, so we kind of like have a, a world, right? So, uh, but this me is created by our, uh, our culture as a way to first avoid the vortex and also to create individual, a sense of individuality uh, that, our, that our society is based on, you, you can't be a free individual unless you have a sense of being an individual. See, we're not a tribe. See, if you live in a tribe, right? If you live in a tribe that is pre-civilization, like, like uh, Aborigines, mm -hmm. Native Americans, there are no individuals. It's just a tribe. So I'm, who are you? Well, I belong to this tribe. There's, so there's no sense of me outside of the. I mean, you can be a me inside the tribe, but your basic identity is the tribe. And you know, and so I mean, we all understand that. My family, you know. So you have a family. So you identify with that family versus other. Hatfields and McCoys, famous family. Each one was a tribe, and they went to war with the other tribe. So uh, there's this tribal consciousness, you know, which really subverts the me. But our secular society idealizes the me. So we want our me's to be totally alone, free-acting individuals. And uh, we don't really, uh, uh, we kind of like shy. So there's a tension uh, between the free individual me and the tribe, which could be family or race or religion, 
You see, a tribe is, is a loose thing, you know. Uh, could be your job, could be your role, you know, the role of women or men in society back in the 50s and 60s was uh, very strict. And if anybody broke with the... So this tribe can also be a duty, right? Your role in life is, is kind of like a tribe, you know, so I'm... Uh, see, up until the... Uh, go back to Route 66. Uh, and if you look back, I, I grew up in, I live in Blackstone, and my wife grew up there. And um, in the 40s and 50s, uh, you had milkmen, you had people who delivered eggs, you had, every, you know, there were a lot of different, and people would stay that for their whole life. You know, butcher, you know, so that would be your role, and maybe your son, or your, you know, you know, or if you were a woman, you know, the role of the housewife, and you might, you know, there would be definite uh, social duties that you conform to and submerged your individuality into. You see, your me didn't resist your role. Right? Did you get the sense of that? Absolutely. You know, so the role, and then the role, of course, you do it to your family, you know, your religion, uh, your race. In the South, you have the two races, uh, each of which was defined by uh, social roles. And you didn't dare, I mean, if you broke that, you see, that was key. <laughs> uh, with the black people, you got lynched if you broke it, you know. Uh, in the Puritan New England, you got burnt. Or you, you know, this is an off thing, but I, if you ever, do you watch the local news? Mm -hmm. Well, once in a while, I, well, after I, well, I'm, you know, after I finish, I, my ritual is that I go home and, and at five o'clock, I have a martini and I watch reruns of John Stewart and Larry Wilmore. Like, and then I, it should be. Okay. Starting. That's good. All right, we're on that. Okay. So the story. I'll start with the story of Voodoo because I really, uh, that the whole, th this story really like frames this whole practice. And uh, I'll put some words up as we go along that we'll dig into. Practice is one of it, like what is it? Uh, but anyway, just the basic story of the Buddha, the legend of the Buddha was that he, uh, when he was born, a soothsayer said, this child's going to be either a, a world spiritual teacher or, or a big king. And his father was a king, so he, of course, wanted him to take over the kingdom. So he prepared a pleasure palace or protective life for his prince so he would not discover any suffering that would want to make him become a spiritual teacher. <coughs> so he lived a rather sheltered life, uh, much like we do in our country now with all of the air conditioning and comforts that we have created through technology so we don't feel any pain. So but we, are, we live in a comfort society, so to speak, you know, and if there's the slightest bit of discomfort, we go crazy, we've got to fix it. Well, my, the power went off, or, or somebody got killed in a traffic accident, so that's not comfortable, so we'll change the laws so nobody will have a wreck there anymore, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, or the vacuum cleaner didn't get that particular dirt up, and that was not comfortable, so we invent a better vacuum cleaner. <laughs> So on we go. So in this sense, so we're, you know, we're living in Buddha's pleasure palace that he grew up in. But then one day, uh, he went into town just for the moment, and uh, his father didn't know about it. So his, his father would go out and sweep the town so he wouldn't see any uncomfortable things. So he saw uh, somebody who was uh, sick, and he said, what is that? And he had a charioteer. Well, people, you know, we get, people get sick, Master. Oh, and that was novel that was a shock to him and so then the next time he went out somebody was uh, old what is that well we get old and then the next time and he pondered that and the next time he went out there, there was a dead person a corpse what is that well we die so these were the three as existential confrontations the buddha had with his life his name was gotama 
then, or Sakyamuni, uh, Sakyamuni uh, Gautama. And so it was, these were as existential encounters, sickness, old age, and death, uh, which, is, which is what those of you that have been here, mm. you got, you'll have to forgive <laughs> my repeating some of the stuff, you know, because okay, they, these two have been here before. <laughs> I always get something new out of it. So, okay. So anyway, I call this, this class the, the, uh, the 50 plus club, because right. you have to be 50 or plus right. to get in. And uh, so the 50 is here, right? And... Uh, all downhill from there. Yeah. <laughs> so you start out zero here to 50, and then 50 down to 100. Uh, or maybe 102. My, my mother lived to be 102. But uh, anyway, so this is... Uh, uh, the, the first half of life is getting stuff. You know, and so that requires a certain map and orientation. How to get a family, how to get a job, stuff, how, how to get stuff. And then after somewhere, we go over the hump and we start losing stuff. You know, health goes, marriages go, people die, uh, family, people get, people we know in our life, you know, there's a loss going on. So, look like this is a positive and this is a negative. Or this is the gaining, and then we start losing, and we need a different map for this stage of life. And society doesn't give us one, because our society is all based on getting stuff. You know, it's basically that's it's what materialism is: is getting material and fixing the material you've got. But it's uh, it's not a spiritual. So we need a spiritual map for this side versus a get map for this side. Uh, so anyway, we start encountering here these existential encounters with our own mortality. Right. So that too, when we're young, we live forever. When you're back in California with, <laughs> yeah. with Alice, you know, I mean, this, you know, where we are now is like I can't even, <laughs> I can't even, you know, imagine, compute that. You know, that'll that'll never happen. I'll die. Let's, now, you know, I want to be dead by the time I'm 30. <laughs> you, know, want, you know, that live fast, die young, and have a good-looking corpse. I remember that yes. from the 50s. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to that. The whole actually. thing, you know. So now, now we've uh, gone past that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so the, anyway, so the Buddha encounter, he's as existential encounter. These were not just seeing somebody. I mean, these he, were confronting his own... Uh, mortality. And so uh, then he went out the fourth time and he saw a monk. <clears throat> and he said, who is that? Well, the, the charioteer, the, his, his valet said, uh, well, that is a renunciate and he's trying to find an answer to the other first three. <laughs> how do I, he's trying to find out how you get out of old age sickness and death. <laughs> so, uh, so that's when that, that was the click. So then he Went back home, packed his bags, uh, left town, headed to the forest, uh, they gave his clothes and his horse to his valet and said, and he put on the clothes of a yogi. And I think this time, this was 400 and 500 BC. At this time in northern India, there was already a thousand years of yoga going on. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like uh, uh, you're just living in a hut somewhere by yourself. I mean, these were established schools of philosophy and great gurus at the time um, who would, had vast followings of students, you know. So he went to, and each one had a different philosophy. So each, he went and tried out each one and found each one lacking. So for seven years he mastered all the teachings that were prevalent of his day and found them all to be lacking. And he was practically at that time asceticism was very strong. So it's that denying the flesh, denying desire, denying uh, eating less, uh, the, the ascetic path to liberation is still here today um, through uh, self-denial, uh, uh, starving yourself, uh, uh, diets, <laughs> meat, vegetarianism, uh, all these things today are part of this path of the renunciate of the asceticism. 
So he tried all those, found them lacking. So then he just went off on his own and he sat down under a tree. And he said, uh, I resolve to sit here until I am awakened and understand the, crack the enigma code of old age, sickness, and death and why we suffer. Basically, it was the enigma code. And we're still trying to crack it. Did y'all see that movie, The Imitation Game? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No? Well, see, it's a great movie. It's on DVD now. What's it about? The Imitation Game is about the British scientist Alan Turing who cracked the German Enigma code yeah, I saw that. and won the war, or shortened it by two or three years. And he was the one that invented the first thinking machine or the right, first computer because right. he invented a thinking machine that could crack the German code machine because no human brain could do it. The reason they couldn't crack it was that the, the the Enigma, the Enigma was the little machines, they had them on all the submarines. When I was down in uh, NAG's uh, uh, Cape Hatteras a couple of weeks ago, there was a museum down there, and they had sunk a German submarine off the coast, and they had captured, they had brought the Enigma machine. machine. So there it was in a little glass case, the Enigma machine that was on this German sub that <coughs> Alan Turing had cracked because the, 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 uh, the the high command could send out messages to the subs on where to meet the convoy. Mm -hmm. And nobody could understand what they were saying because there were so many variables in the code. It like, could take uh, uh, 100,000 years of manipulating these variables to come up with a sentence. But the, but the machine reset itself every 24 hours. So they had 24 hours. They had a whole big building full of code crackers. They had 24 hours to figure out what, these, what the variables were saying before it reset. So it's kind of like Cinderella. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every night at midnight, the whole thing resets and you start over. So they couldn't do it. So Alan Turing invented a machine that could think fast enough to figure out the variables before it reset. And uh, the, the other key to this was, and I'll relate this a minute, but the, uh, the other interesting thing I saw in this movie was that the machine could not figure out what the Enigma code was. It was just thinking, this, the machine thinking machine it was just running, 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 running. And it couldn't, and it, it wouldn't stop, when it stopped, that would mean it clicked and understood it wouldn't stop. So they were all, they had given up. They were all sitting in a bar. And uh, another code woman from another department or something said that, you know, well, they, she looks at these German messages all the time and said, uh, one of them says, uh, every time he writes a message, he says, Heil Hitler. And a light went on. That was the constant. So every message, so so they, they, they wrote, they typed into the thinking machine, uh, Heil Hitler, and so it, uh, and I really didn't understand how to do it, but it gave the machine a constant that was in all of the messages. That was, so it was able to, so that's when it cracked. Because there was one, it was like, if, if you have an infinite number of variables, there's, there's no place, there's no center. So they found one thing that was constant in all the messages, and that became the center around which the thinking machine could unraveled the code, and they broke it. And I thought that was very interesting because here's another word, center. And another word, thinking machine. Hmm. Um, so anyway, getting jumping back. Now, by the way, y'all two, uh, these two are used to me. <laughs> but I think on my, when I do this class, this is not prepared. I don't come with a lesson plan. I don't come with uh, any preparation at all. So I create the class with us here. Um, and uh, sometimes somebody, you may bring up something that happened during the week, and the whole class will form around that. You know, I mean, so it's, or something happened to me or something, whatever. Or a movie you saw or something. So I really encourage interaction and 
questions or whatever, because it all really integrates. So getting, jumping back from, now we're, we're trying to jump now from uh, the, plus, the 50 plus club to uh, Siddhartha the Buddha uh, trying to solve the enigma of human suffering and what he did and the enigma with the thinking machine in the center. So what Buddha did was he uh, he'd almost starved himself to death and so he just said, I quit. I'm going to sit under this tree, it's called Bodhi tree or the uh, fig tree or something. And he said, I'm going to sit here until I discover the enigma. And um, so he did. And he sat there for seven days. And he began to go through the stages of enlightenment. And um, oh, I, I think the other key to the legend was that he was about ready, he was about to die from starvation. And a girl who herded cows came by with a bowl of milk, and she gave him a bowl of milk, and that restored him so he could continue his practice. So then he was challenged by Mara, which is an equivalent to the challenge of Jesus in the desert by Satan. Mara means the mind. So he was challenged by the mind, his, her mind. And the three challenges or temptations were, the first one was uh, desire. So Mara presented temptations and the Buddha was not moved. Uh, the second temptation was fear, fear of death. So, so he attacked him with elephants and all kinds of stuff and the Buddha sat unmoved and the arrows turned to flowers. And um, so the third temptation was probably the most important, but I feel, what, but the third temptation was the uh, Mara said, uh, by what authority do you claim your being, your existence? By what authority do you sit here and say you are awakened? Uh, uh, some teacher? I mean, what, what authority? And what about your duty, your duty to your family? The authority of your, your birthright, your, your, your prince. Um, you have a wife and a son back there. You know, what, what, you know, what, 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 by, by what law, uh, by what authority do you ground yourself in? And Buddha didn't answer. He just touched, he, a lot of the pictures of the Buddha, you'll see, his one hand is touching the earth. So he just responded by touching the earth. And when he did that, the tree broke in, the tree above him broke, showered him with flowers, and the whole, this is all legend, you know, but the trees, you know, the earth broke into flowers at that touch. Yeah. And, and so this, I always, like, this is, this is the touch of the uh, Pillsbury Doughboy. Yes. <laughs> when that finger comes yeah. down and touches, it <laughs> and leaves a touch, and he said, they took that out. But I used to, that always stuck in my mind, you know, that, that image of the Pillsbury Doughboy and touching and making an imprint, you know, and the giggle, you know, but that touch, um, Steve Jobs touched computers mm -hmm. and made them come alive. When he saw that the mouse, you could touch the computer with the mouse, and now you got touch screens, you know, you touch the computer, you touch the thinking machine and it responds, you touch the earth and it responds. Um, let me jump what, the, to George to uh, Seinfeld, yeah. and whenever George Costanza would get a parking lot, a parking space that was favorable, he thought it was a miracle. He thought finally, basically his his exhilaration was that finally the world recognizes me, yeah. and offers me a parking lot. You see and that 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 hunger for being touched by the external world to not being a thinking machine. You know, it's alive. You know, this Frankenstein, you know, all this whole, it's, it's everywhere in our movies and everything. It's the, the touch, uh, people touch each other. When you fall in love, it's a touch. Uh, uh, this whole idea of, uh, of um, touching somebody, wanting to be touched, uh, becoming alive when you're touched. Uh, Pinocchio comes alive, you know. Mm -hmm. This whole idea of being asleep and then waking up by the touch of a princess or a prince. You know, the snow white, the kiss. 
It's all in the mythology, all in the fairy tales, is that uh, this magical touch that awakens us uh, to something that we know, but we knew we didn't have it before the touch. And in touch, uh, an encounter, a chance encounter is a touch. You know, that, oh my God, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, just to finish up the legend, so then he went through the awakening process and he realized that he was a Buddha. Now the Buddha is not a person or a personality. Uh, Buddha means the awakened one. That's it. So it's kind of like a, uh, uh, a state of being. And one of the uh, central part, one of the central uh, axioms of truth of Buddhism is that everyone has Buddha nature. So everyone is a Buddha, potentially. You see, uh, we are Buddha, but we're not. It's potential because we're not feeling it. But you don't really feel you're a Buddha. I won't get into that. <laughs> so um, another aspect of this class is that we're going to um, uh, work with the uh, what's called the here's another word Dharma um, it's, there are different levels of meaning of Dharma one of them is teaching so Dharma is a teaching and it's the teaching of the Buddha he taught for 45 years. All of it, uh, he was in an oral tradition. Nothing was written down for 400 years. So all of his, he went, he awakened thousands of monks. And, and back in those oral tradition days, people could memorize a whole scripture because there was no writing. So they would memorize all of his talks and pass them down through the generations. And then around uh, 400 years later, they began to write them down. So this was an oral tradition. The reason I go back to, let me just take a little detour back to, uh, let me come on, and I'll look at it. And it is a parade of offenders of the tribe. And it's amazing now that uh, anybody that breaks the social order a husband takes his kid on a joy ride and the wife calls the cops and now he's got a mugshot on TV for kidnapping his child. You know, that it could be really no trial yet, right? But there he is. Uh, and I, I just remember, like, it's like New England Puritanism come back with the public stocks. Yeah. Right? And if you break the order, you're, you're being shamed. So local news is like a shaming <laughs> process where the whole, the entertainment is who's being shamed today. You know, you know, pub, you know so they broke the law and they're going to go to jail or whatever. They're going to put the public shaming is what is curious to me. You know, why, why should I care that uh, somebody stole some, you know, ran from the cops and got caught? You know, I mean, is that, you know, it's, it's kind of like this, uh, it's our inner, but that's a sidestep, you know, but this whole thing. Uh, anyway, but this whole structure that we're looking at here is that in this teaching, in the context of this teaching, is that this is a false center. And in the Dharma teaching, the cause of our suffering, old age, sickness, and death, the cause is our investment in the false center, or you could say idol. So our me has become so uh, ingrained culturally that we believe it actually exists as a thing, and of course, if me exists as a thing, then me is going to die and get old, and it's going to get old and sick and die. And now I've got, I'm faced with the vortex. 
when I die, where will me go? <laughs> Down the vortex, you see. So it's kind of like a self-created torture chamber uh, that we can't see because we're kind of like a fish in a fishbowl and you can't see the bowl. So we're swimming in it. Every now and then we'll break into the truth of this, but we don't have a map in which to understand it. So it just goes by and we, we attribute it to something else. Uh, uh, but but th this whole structure of me as being separate from the world as an observer uh, is kind of like the placemats of the social table that holds everybody together. So if you look at the conversations of me's, most of them are complaints and how I'm a victim. You, know, you should have seen what that person did to me in Walmart. You know, that whole, you, it's just all around us. People, all, everyone, this me is, is, is a victim. Somebody's always doing something to me. And of course I will find another me that I can share this with. And the agreement is, well, I'll share my pain with you and then, then you can share yours with me. Right? So then we tell them their, our pain, what happened to me at the doctor's office and all that, and then they'll tell me about theirs. And we kind of like our me's will be affirmed. We get, we get, our center gets shored up, you see. Because <laughs> any attack on me attacks my center and threatens me with the vortex. Because the vortex is just right, right, you know, right, right with thin ice, you know, it's right there. So any threat, anybody looks at me cross-eyed, Threatens, threatens my center, the stability of my me, and, and the dread comes up, you see. So, so, the, so we need, so this, this whole practice, this, I say practice against, but the Dharma practice is a practice of, first of all, understanding the map, and the next thing is the actual practice of seeing this in our everyday world. When you go home, do you all uh, live by yourself, or you got a partner? Or? Um, no, I'm a widow. Okay, so you live by yourself? Yeah. yeah. Me too. Okay. Or well, good. kind of. Okay. I live with my daughter and son-in-law okay. upstairs. In okay, house. but you have your own space. Then. Yes, I have. Yeah. My own okay. Space. Well, yeah. Space, okay. Right? Well, Virginia here, so I called. See, everyone else in the the other class was had partners, you know. So Virginia's our monk here. She lives by herself. So you all, there, there's two paths in the world. One of them is the, is the household path where you have a marriage, you know. And then there's the renunciate, you know, where you live alone. Right? So you all are in that, you all are taking that path now. You know? So there's, there is a lot of, uh, so it's very similar to the, uh, with, you know, in other words, if you want to discover the uh, enigma of the world, and the cause of old age, sickness, and death. And I'm not saying the physical, I mean, the body's going to get old and die. I'm talking about the psychological suffering of old age, sickness, and death is what we're talking about. So if you want to crack the code, one path is to leave the world and go to a spiritual retreat or a monster where you don't have to worry about bills and all that, and you can focus on meditation and uh, the simplicity of life, gardening, and you're able to begin to observe how the me works, and you begin to observe the laws of me, and you begin to notice uh, how you can relax our investment in me, and and uh, dis and and begin to find our true center. The other path which is the path of the, the lay person or the householder or the path of the world and is in which you practice the monastic traditions while you are in the world. And this is called lay Buddhism or, or lay meditation. Uh, but it's the idea, uh, and yoga is all about this, where you've got a job and you've got a family and you've got relationships and all that but you can make that a spiritual practice while you're in the world, instead of having to leave it and go live in a monastery or a retreat or some cave or something. 
So the ascetic path is no longer very possible today because we don't have monasteries and monks and, you know, everybody's in the world. You know, so we have to discover the beauty of this practice is that it is a way to be liberated from the world while you're in the world rather than leaving the world. Um, okay, Yoga Nidra. Let me, let me, let, let's, all right, so there, there's, there's two wings to this bird here. One of them is, is wisdom, which is understanding of the lay of the ground of the mind. And the other is practice. So you need both in order to fly in a straight line. If you just have one, you're going to fly like this, you see. Or like this, all right? So the, the practice part is, is applied understanding, um, which is different from, so this, this, this idea of dharma is split into two wings. Practice and understanding. Okay? You need both because uh, the under, if, if the, the idea here is that the, the place map that is provided by our society in our world uh, is, is structures reality in a certain way. And that holds us like gravity. So it's very difficult uh, on your own to, to leave this table because you don't know what the other table is. So there is, so how do you go from a place where you are, where you're, you're centered in a false center to keep you out of the vortex. How do you go from that to a true center that is not subject to fear of the vortex? How do you go from being above the ground to being on the ground? Well, there is a big no man's land there. Um, when I was in the Navy, I was in submarines. And when the ship, when the submarine's on the surface, it's a surface ship. And when it's below the surface, it's an undersea ship. And it has entirely different laws governing it, different ways of steering it. When, when it's below the surface, it has fins, right? And when it's on the surface, it has a rudder. It has a rudder under the surface, but it has fins under the surface. So if you want to go down, you go green. You want to go up, like that, you see. But you don't, they fold up when you're on the surface. So everything up in the surface, you operate on diesel engines. This was an old submarine boat, not the nuclear. Diesel engines on the surface, batteries below the surface. Totally different systems. The dangerous part for the submarines, at least for these old boats, was that when you went from a surface ship to an undersea ship, you had to fill the ballast tanks with water so that you would become heavier and you would sink. So you would intentionally sink, right? Surface ship, you blow a hole in the hull, fills it with water, and it sinks. Well, they don't like to do that. <laughs> Submarines did it intentionally. We'll fill the hull, we'll fill the tanks with water, and we'll sink. But it's controlled, right? So you just sink this far. <coughs> Now you're on the Is that in, in addition to the fins? You have the fins which... When you would submerge, down? you would lower the... Um, oh, crap, I forgot what they're called. But they, they come down and they operate like this. Okay. So and, would, and it also fills with water? The, there are tank called ballast tanks. Yeah. And you would, they would be empty on the surface. So you buoy it. You want to become an undersea craft, you have to fill the ballast tanks. So you open the ballast tanks and water comes in. Okay. And you go down. I didn't know that. I had no idea how they went. And you go down. And then you stop. 
shut the tanks if I want to stay here. You want to go mm -hmm. deeper, you blow them more up. You right? want to go up, you let the water then out. You, then they have compressed air. You can't let the water out. Oh. There's compressed air, and you blow it up. Okay. You blow the air out, and up you go. I'll be darned. But the point is that the transition period between surface ship and undersea ship is dangerous because when your tanks are half blown, half empty and half full, if it's in a storm, a big wave, if you hit, you can tip you over. See, yeah. because you're not stable. There, there is a transition period. So what I'm saying here is that in this practice, there is a transition period from being a surface person who just goes with the fleet. Right? You just go with, the, go with the tribe and you go with the family and whatever you've known. This is the known, right? You just go with what you know. and not been working, but that's all I got. Uh, you know, I may be in pain all the time, but it's what I got, you know. So the unknown, I don't know what it is, but I hear a call to it. You know, something's calling me. So you wouldn't be here if, if you didn't hear this call. So there's an invitation to leave the known, which is the placemats that have, that have been at my table, and to go to an unknown, but there is a transition period that I don't know what, what's going on, you see. So that's kind of like what the function of this class is. Uh, I feel, is to give you uh, an understanding of what the passage is and then the practice so that you can do it yourself because nobody can do it for you, right? So you have to swim yourself, but you need an understanding of people who have gone before so you won't feel the vortex threatening you when you start letting go of the thinking machine. Because meditation is all about sitting and allowing the thinking machine to do what it wants without identifying with it and saying, oh, I shouldn't think that, or I wonder how I'm doing. You know, well, that's a thought. <laughs> you know, in other words, the thinking machine in time begins to quiet. It's kind of like with the submarine. I mean, on the surface, it's very noisy up there because it's, it's not really made for surface going. The submarine's really made for undersea. So on the surface, it's a bouncy ride. I mean, it's like you're, I used to live up in the Ford torpedo room, and if it was sea, was rough. I mean, you're, vroom, you know, vroom, like this, you know. I mean, you're really going up and down. You're all in a tube, call it the iron coffin. <laughs> You know, because you can't see out. There's no reference point outside. So, uh, but when you're down, when you, when, you serve, when you submerge off the surface, it's very still, quiet, just silent. You, know? you hear a ship go above. The destroyers are looking for you. Your depth charge is off in the distance. <laughs> and they're ping, they're ping, they're looking for you. Ping, boop, ping, boop. <laughs> <That's very laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, so this, uh, I always felt like that this, I was in the subs from 57, 56 to 61, it was five years, one summary. I always felt like it was a precursor of my practice of meditation, you know, because I was a soul mm. yes. uh, So anyway, this, this whole idea of uh, running silent, run deep was the submarine mantra. And it really is about meditation. Um, because if you want to get beneath the me, the me is not going to go off the surface. The me is a surface ship, and it goes with the fleet. It doesn't go by itself. It goes with the fleet. 
um, whether it's the whole society or whether it's your family or whether it's your history or your religion or whatever, the knee is going to go with the fleet. And the fleet's going to have a center that keeps the fleet. It's going to have an admiral that, that keeps the fleet. Otherwise, the ships just go all over the place. So there has to be a center to the fleet so it will go together. Right? And so all the Mies invest in the center. And they all agree that this is the center. So, you know, this is what presidential elections are all about. We're electing a center. Right? So if the majority of people elect a center, which is a person, then we all agree, because the majority rules, that this is the center for the next four years. Or maybe eight, but no more. Then we kill the king, and a new king is elected. The king is dead. The center is dead. Long live the center. You know, so we, we left England where they were, their center was the divine king, right? And so when he died, his person was the center. When he died, a new king is the center. Well, the democracy model was that you elect your king, right, for a limited time, but you kill him politically at the end of his term, not physically. I'm told Oswald tried it, but I mean, I mean, we've had a few. But the, the idea with the structure is that you kill him politically, right? So the end of his four eight years, and four years, you know, the, the other people that want to be the center are going to try and knock him off <coughs> politically, right? So if they knock him off, then they have a new center, and he holds the country together. So that whole idea of the center, you know, is the president is the center that holds the country together. Um, or if you go to a town, the mayor, um, or a family is going to have a center, it's either going to be the matriarch or the patriarch. It's going to be a strong mother or a strong father. It's going to have one. Because um, you can't have two centers. One center. But this whole idea of the center, uh, it's, it's paradox because it's necessary but it's also the cause of our anguish, which in the second half of life begins to get pretty strong. Because now death in the vortex is, is breathing uh, closer to us, and we want to find out if there is.